of the uh, strain and stresses of the band practices and that he gets a good nap. How many of you believe in divine healing? Do you think of it as divine healing or faith healing or what do you think? What, what's the term that comes to your mind when you think of the type of healing that we've been talking about today, that George was talking about in the song, and that uh, Angela was talking about in the poem, and that Sarah was talking about in the, in the prayer that came from the United Methodist Hymnal? Is there a term that you have in your mind? Most people, it's either divine healing or faith healing. Any other terms that anybody has in your mind for that? Uh, do, do you realize that a huge number of the population doesn't believe in divine or faith healing at all? That it is even ridiculed by a large segment of the population? But unbelief is rampant in terms of faith healing, divine healing. It wasn't always that way. I can remember growing up as a boy in this community when uh, Aunt Valley Tenney, uh, my, who married my uncle Ed Tenney, she was a Shirey before she married him, and her father, Mr. Shirey, had the gift of healing. He could heal. He, I don't know that he could heal everything, but there were certain things he could heal. And he was well known in the community, and people went to him for healings, and he delivered healings, of the, at least of the types that he was, that he had the gift for. And I just talked to Corrine about him a little bit while ago before the service started. And uh, she told me about some things that I, I didn't know about. That he had some, that he saw some signs. And was actually able to make predictions, prophecies based on, on those signs. So I grew up knowing that, uh, that there were people who had the gift of healing. I'll say also that, looking at it from another standpoint, as a very young boy, I was a sickly child. I had, uh, when I, until I was probably eight or ten years old, I suffered nosebleeds, terrible ear aches, um, and was in pain a lot of the time. And sometimes I couldn't sleep, and my folks did all of the many, many folk remedies that were common at the time. Acidity bags, rubbing certain compounds and poultices on me. Uh, you know, a lot of things I had no idea what they were doing. But I don't know that M did any good. Uh, they didn't do any harm either. Uh, I was even taken to a African American. I'm not sure. I think some people called him a witch doctor. Some called him a faith healer. You know, depended, I guess, on your belief system. But I was a very young boy at that time. And I was kind of scared when they took me into his house. And he took me on and put me on his knee. And the problem they told him was the nose, mainly it was the nosebleeds and the terrible earaches. And I don't know what his gift was. But I do remember hearing his diagnosis, and I'll never forget it. He picked me up off his knee, handed me back to them, and said, this boy has a lot of blood in him, and some of it has to come out. <laughs> that was the diagnosis. Now, in that case, I never recovered from either of those until Beth Newkirk, who comes here with some regularity, who's, who was my first cousin and my protector as a young boy. Uh, she was taken by her parents to the hospital in Winsboro, which is up on Main Street. 
it was in a big house that Dr. Stewart practiced medicine. And she was going to have her tonsils taken out. I was four years younger than she. And my folks, who might never have done that, had not Beth had her taken out. So well, why don't we just send Joey along with Beth and let him take his out too? Because Dr. Stewart had told me numerous times they needed to come out. And so we were both in that hospital and had our tonsils taken out. I never had any of those symptoms again after my tonsils were taken out. So there is a place in life for faith healing, divine healing, and there's a place for medicine. Uh, however, there is no doctor that I know of or ever heard of who does not admit without qualification that what they do in their practice of medicine is to assist the healing, the natural, the divine healing process. I think all doctors uh, can see that in one way or another. I wanted to give you that background before reading today's scripture because there is a great division of opinion on, this, on divine healing and faith healing, even within the church. Move, uh, go with me to James chapter 5, we'll begin on verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, having anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he hath committed sins, they too shall be forgiven him. Confess your sins one to another, pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I was reading out of the John Wesley personal translation of the, of the New Testament. This is a book titled, written in the middle 1740, uh, around 1740, between 1740 and 1750, the explanatory notes upon the New Testament. It is Wesley's translation of the New Testament and his comments on it. It has never been out of print since the middle of 1700s. Not many books can make that kind of claim. In one of his footnotes on that particular scripture that I just read, John Wesley says, this single conspicuous gift, healing, which Christ committed to his apostles and here John Wesley refers us to Mark 6, verse 13. Remained in the church long after the other miraculous gifts were withdrawn. Indeed, it seems to have been healing designed to remain always. And St. James directs the elders who were the most, if not the only, gifted men to administer it. This was the whole process of medicine in the Christian church till it was lost through unbelief. I repeat that. This was the whole process of medicine in the Christian church, and he's talking about the early Christian church, until it was lost through unbelief. Now, the verse that uh, John Wesley refers to, which was the basis for the gift that James is talking about, you remember, was uh, Mark 
chapter 6, verse 13. I'm going to read that verse to you now. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. This was right after Jesus, or just before Jesus had talked to the twelve, sent them out two by two on their missions of mercy. So that's the background. And John Wesley comments on that particular verse. And he says, when St. James gives a general direction, adding the peremptory words, and the Lord shall heal him, he shall be restored to health, not by the natural efficacy of the oil, but by the supernatural blessing of God. And it seems this was the great standing means of healing desperate diseases in the early Christian church. The early church was a healing church. They inherited that from their Judaism roots, from the roots of the Jews from which Christianity sprang, of course. For many years, Christianity was a sect, a subset of uh, Judaism. And what a Jew would do when he got sick, instead of going to the doctor, he'd go to the rabbi who would anoint him with oil and pray over. That's how the Christian church arrived at the medicinal gifts, the gifts of healing. And this was true for a long time, even in the second century uh, and the third century. We had some of the early church fathers who wrote, and their writings have survived, that tell us that this type of healing that James talked about was still very, very prevalent in the 2nd and the 3rd century. As a matter of fact, in the 3rd century, no less a person than the Roman emperor took sick in a very desperate type of illness and was healed by the anointing of oil and prayer of a Christian. Totally healed. Resumed his duties as emperor and kept that Christian as a guest in his house for the rest of his life. That's how prominent and how successful the healing properties of the church, the Christian church, were in the early days. There are a lot of Christians today who still believe in the power of divine healing. But unfortunately, Many don't. And we learned from John Wesley in the 1700s that unbelief is the greatest enemy of divine healing. Amen. That the single greatest factor that is likely to cause a failure in healing is unbelief. And that unbelief could be in the hands of the person administering the healing. It could be in, primarily, though, in the hands of of the person who is being healed. That person must, simply must, believe. I'm using today a Bible that was used in the eastern part, and not the western part of Christianity, The old, uh, some of the old uh, eastern traditions, uh, many of which have, been, have preserved some of the older traditions some of which have fallen away in, in the western uh, part of the church. But uh, to indicate why belief is so important, belief in healing is so important, we can go to Mark chapter 11, beginning on verse 22. And this is shortly after, some of you remember the scripture where Jesus curses a fig tree, and a lot of people kind of chuckle when they come to know why would Jesus curse a fig tree? Well, the fig tree hadn't done its job. So Jesus cursed the fig tree. And not long after that, Jesus and his disciples happened to pass that same area. And Simon Peter notices that this fig tree is withered. 
And he comments to Jesus about it. And Jesus says, saying to them, if you have faith in God, truly I say to you, whatever should say, whoever should say to the mountain, be, be moved and fall into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will be done. It will be done to him. Anything you pray for and ask, believe, and you will receive it. And it will be done for you. And when you stand up to pray, forgive whoever you have, anything you have, against any man, so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you will not forgive, even your Father in heaven will not forgive your trespasses. So not only must we believe, we must be willing to forgive. Another point. When we go to Matthew chapter 5, and uh, beginning in verse 2, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 2, this is, the, this is the scripture where a leper came and worshipped Jesus. Right, oh, by the way, this is, right after, this is right after chapter 7, which ends the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has come down from the Mount after delivering the Sermon on the Mount. And this leper approaches him and worships him. And he says, My Lord, if you wish, you can cleanse me. I'll read that again. If you wish, you can cleanse me. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I do wish it. Be cleansed. And at that hour, his leprosy was cleansed. Now, of those, of everyone in the New Testament who ever sought healing from Christ during his earthly ministry, this leper was the only one who added the phrase, if you will, if thou will. No one else did that, only the leper. And if you notice, the first thing Jesus did before healing him was to correct the man's theology. He said, I wish to do it. I will to do it. It is my will to do it. Because Jesus' ministry turned none away. All were eligible to be healed, each and every one who approached him. So if it be thy will, despite what happens so often today, is not a proper thing to put in a prayer, especially a healing prayer. Before healing him, Jesus corrected the theology because it is not enough to believe that God can do something. It is absolutely necessary to believe that God will do something. Amen. I would like to see that phrase eliminated from my prayer. If it be that will. We know it. We know, and especially when it comes to healing, we know it's God's will. All we have to do is read the New Testament. That the only time that phrase was used, Jesus corrected it. If we know that something will happen, we must uh, be entirely accepted of that fact and understand that Jesus, or the Father, or the Holy Spirit, wants it to happen just as much, if not more, than we do. I would like to offer a small bit of proof that what happened in the Christian, the early Christian church, not only continues, but was intended to continue. Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1. Of course, this book was written by Luke, the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke. He said, the first book have I written concerning all the things which our Lord Jesus Christ began to do and teach. Began to do and teach. He goes on to say, until the day when he ascended, after through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. But the fact that Jesus began 
Luke puts it, began to do and to teach. Means that what the Lord began both to do and to teach was to be continued by the Holy Spirit and operating through the church, the Christian church. Jesus did his work while he was in the earthly ministry in cooperation and in reliance on the Holy Spirit as well as the Father. As a matter of fact, we can go to John chapter 14, verse 12, and find uh, proof of that. Truly I say unto you, he who believes in me shall do the works which I do, and even greater. Because I am going to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, I will do it for you, so that the Father may be glorified through his Son. If you ask me in my own name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask of my Father, and he will send you another comforter to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because he has not seen him and does not know him, but you know him because he abides with you and he abides within you, as he abides within all saved Christians. So the Holy Spirit is a great cooperator and an important part of any divine healing, any faith healing, and we just can call him the Holy Spirit. Is that not right, uh, Roger Schneider? The Holy Spirit is someone that is a friend to all, and Jesus used him, cooperated with him, relied on him during his ministry. And I would like to also mention that uh, those who sought healing from Christ during the early ministry, uh, some of them, I would say all of them, had firm belief uh, in his ability to heal them. That was never in question. Not even the one who added the phrase, if it be your will. He believed it. But for some reason he added that unnecessary phrase which Jesus corrected him. I want to emphasize that Jesus was carrying on a tradition that his father had started way, way back in the Old Testament. So that Jesus was not necessarily starting something new with his healing ministry. If we go back to Exodus, the second uh, book in the uh, Old Testament, the, in the Torah, Go to Exodus 15, uh, starting at uh, verse 25. And this is after, right after the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea. And they came upon some water that was not fit to drink. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What will we drink? And Moses prayed before the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the water, the water became sweet. The Lord taught him laws and ordinances and tested him and said to him, If you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his sight and will obey his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will bring none of these plagues upon you which I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord your healer. For I am the Lord, your healer. This is Yahweh, God the Father, talking to the children of Israel. If we could read Hebrew, that would have said we would have said Jehovah Rapha. And that means the Lord, your healer. That's one of about seven covenant names for the Lord, for the Lord God the Father. And we should we should know that this is God's first promise to heal for all. Healing for all was a promise that dates back to the point 
in Exodus, which after they crossed the Red Sea, or the Reed Sea, whichever you prefer, um, and God promises to be the healer of his people, all of his people. I'll also notice that it's an I am saying. He says, I am the Lord your healer. Now, this is one of the I am statements that very few people are familiar with. It's not one of those that Jesus copies in John. John has several of those wonderful I am statements. Where does the I am statements go back to? They go back to the burning bush when Moses is trying to find out uh, God the Father's name. And he says, I am who I am. I am what I am. I am. And I am kind of became... Anytime anyone said, I am, in an authoritative way, it was taken for granted that this was a reference to Yahweh. In the Old Testament, God promises to be plenteous in his healing powers. And he offers it to, not to some, but to all. All who come to him, I am the Lord, your healer. What I would like to do is to conclude what I call a massed healing prayer is to ask everyone, I'm going to do this like you remember the old days or maybe you've heard your folks talk about the old days when people lined out hymns. They didn't have books. And so whoever the song leader was called out the line of the hymn and they sang that line and then the, the liner called out another line and then the congregation said, well, we're not going to sing this but uh, I want to conclude by lining out with a prayer that I will call out the line and then everyone will repeat the line okay. we'll do it now. and I'm, I'm choosing this particular prayer because both Jim and Mary Hilton are veterans of the walk to Emmaus. And we have several in this room who've been on the walk to Emmaus. And if you have not been on the walk to Emmaus, a capsule summary of it is it's 72 hours of concentrated time with God. And when you come out of it, you're on a mountaintop. And you stay there for a long time. Um, hopefully you never come down. But uh, there is a prayer and an opening prayer in the, in the reunion uh, groups for the uh, veterans of the Emmaus Walk. And it's a prayer for the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm going to line out for. So when I call out a line, please repeat the line, and I'll call out another. <coughs> Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. And kindle in them the fire of your love. And kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit. Send forth your spirit. And they shall be created. And they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. And you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant thou the same Holy Spirit. Grant thou the same Holy Spirit. We may be truly wise. We may be truly wise. And enjoy. We ask or think according to his mighty power that works in us. Unto him be glory in his church by Jesus Christ, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen.